Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. A terrible student. That's how ukulele master Roy Sakuma described himself on Long Story Short last week as he recalled his childhood attending public schools in Honolulu. He started cutting out of school in kindergarten. He was smoking at the age of six, drinking by the sixth grade. He spent time in juvenile detention and he dropped out of high school. Today, the internationally acclaimed ukulele teacher and business owner Roy Sakuma visits schools to share his love of music and his message of hope. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. For the first time on last week's Long Story Short, ukulele empresario Roy Sakuma revealed why he didn't bother much with school as a kid. He explained that his late mother and brother suffered from serious, untreated mental illness. Roy, his father, and sister lived with a family secret. Before we continue Roy Sakuma's Long Story Short, let's revisit his childhood in Makiki. What were your growing up years like? Uh, it, it, it was difficult. Uh, you know, I, I went through a lot of pain, and I, I didn't realize it two years later, but, you know, when, when I was born, my mother was uh, diagnosed as, uh, you know, she had paranoia, schizophrenia, and she had it severe. So I, I didn't have a normal childhood. And as the years went by, oh. it only got worse because uh, my brother at nine years old also had a mental breakdown. So, you know, our, our, our home was filled with a lot of um, difficulty. Was your dad in the home? My dad was home, but because my mother and brother were both mentally ill, it was hard for him. It, you know, there was never any logical communication, so my father would go out every night, and naturally uh, he enjoyed drinking, so he'd, he'd be drinking seven nights a week. Paranoid schizophrenia today is a very mm -hmm. treatable disease. Was there medication available for your mother? You know, at that time, way back, from what I understand, my father told me that they didn't have, or I, what's the word I'm trying to say, is that um, he couldn't take my mother to get any help because at that time it was shameful. He, he did tell me years later, though, that he tried to commit her. But what happened is that no one would help him in the family because my mother's mother would not allow it. She I felt see. that was taboo. That means your your brother was also untreated when he had his uh, no, problem. No, we my father sent him to the Kanoe Mental Institution where he received treatment, and he would get these uh, medications where they would release him. But the problem is, is that every time they released him, he had to go back in because he would get another breakdown, and so it was a struggle. Because uh, I remember when he was young, uh, when I was young, he tried to he tried to uh, kill me one time with a knife. And so ever since then, I was only like 11 years old. Uh, every time he came home, I would be, I couldn't sleep in bed. You know, I'd be shivering because I'd be afraid that, you know, in my sleep he was going to do something to me and harm me. So it, it was a struggle those years. It was very painful. And there was no adult you could speak with about it? There was no adult. And, and that's why I developed all these misconceptions in life. And it wasn't until I became a young adult, I think I was like 19 years old, I decided that I needed to do something about this. So I went to a psychologist and talked to him, and that was a turning point of my life. Okay. I can share this now. I mean, before, I, I didn't talk too much about this, especially being this deep into the pain that I had, but it, it, it was a really big struggle. And luckily, as the years went by uh, through this therapy, it, it helped me a lot. And how's your brother who had a mental uh, illness doing? He committed doing? suicide. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking how treatable schizophrenia is if the person has access to and is willing to take medication. What are your thoughts now? Well, I, I realize that it's, it is treatable because what happened is I had to make a choice in my life once, and I wanted my father's life to be better. And so I took it upon myself to committing my mother to the Kanoe Mental Hospital. Once you became an adult? Yes, and it was very difficult because, you know, no one wanted to get involved with this, and rightfully so, because it was a very difficult thing to do. We had to actually have them come over and strap her down, because I knew she wouldn't go willingly. And I'll never forget, as they wheeled her out of the house, she told me, I hate you, I disown you, 
and I will never talk to you again. And then they took away, and I was devastated. But I knew this is something that I had to do. So what happened is through the medication that she took, eventually it came to the point where she, we could have conversations between each other and with my sister. And she really changed a lot. I mean, the change was significant, where we actually had a mom that we could talk to. She wasn't totally there, but she came a long way where we could actually have simple conversations. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful that despite, you know, it was painful then, but the reward was 20 times greater because now I could talk to my mother. So often, people who found success have had to overcome adversity and have pressed tirelessly to achieve their goals. That certainly is the case for Roy Sakuma. He worked very hard to overcome the confusion and self-doubt resulting from mental illness in his family and his disrupted and limited formal education. And when he decided to play the ukulele, he practiced and practiced until he mastered his craft. You know, I know in the hands of a master uh, mm -hmm. what an ukulele sounds like, but I have to say that I can't play any instrument, even the kazoo, uh, <laughs> but I can play the ukulele. Uh, it seems like it, it'll it adapt to whatever level you bring to it. Yes, uh, I agree with you. The ukulele to me is one of the easiest instruments to learn in the world. It's perfect for anyone. and and. You know, like I've seen so many people that say, tell me, I cannot play. I, I am toned there. <laughs> and, you know, I can prove them wrong. There is not a person in the world that I don't think I can, I cannot teach. And that comes from my upbringing. You know, because I struggled so much, because I had no musical sense, and I had to learn everything from phase one all the way up. So you can come to me with 10 problems or, you know, and as soon as I see you touch the ukulele, I can make the adjustments just like that because I know already because uh, I, I think that was the foundation for me being so junk on the ukulele so when I see students that struggle you relate to it so you can work them through it had I been a gifted student then I don't think I would have been a really good teacher because I think a lot of uh, I wouldn't be able to comprehend why are you having so much trouble so it, it turned out good for me that I was a lousy. <laughs> I think I was the worst student ever. <laughs> turned out very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, a lot of people thought I was such an outgoing, friendly guy, but uh, they didn't know that inside I was really hurting. And I, I think this is right after when I got kicked out of school. Um, you know, I heard a song. I heard a song on the radio, and it was a song uh, recorded by Ota-san. And that song, was the turning part in my life yeah. because what happened is that I went to see him to learn a little about the ukulele and that took away a lot of my pain because now I was focusing on something that was made me happy. Why did you go to see him based on a song? What was the song? The song was called Sushi. I don't know if you recall this. It was recorded in 1963. It became the number one hit in Hawaii was for the Tom Moffat show. How did it go? I vaguely remember. Oh, uh, <laughs> you could ask me to sing. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. And it, it was an instrumental. And I went to see him. I was 16 years old at this time. And, and the wonderful thing is that I want to share this with everyone, is you know how they say, never give up your dreams? Well, at 10 years old, I tried learning the ukulele lesson. I couldn't. At 12, I tried again. I couldn't. At 14, my sister tried to teach me to hold G. I couldn't hold a chord. I couldn't strum. I had no sense of rhythm because, as I mentioned earlier to you, I never listened to the radio. So I, I couldn't do it. So she told me, give up. But when I heard that song, I was 16, I decided to you know, seek out Ota-san. I asked him to teach me. He started teaching me. And so I think I wouldn't be teaching the ukulele today had it not been for that song, Sushi. Well, that took guts, a 16-year-old kid who'd been kicked out of school going to this ukulele virtuoso. Uh -huh. uh, I, one thing that I, I had, I think, in me was I was never afraid, though, to approach people as much as I was insecure inside because that's how I survived by not being afraid to talk to people or reach out and ask people questions and and yet inside i was just so nervous you know 
but I, I learned to deal with that, uh, and it, it, you know, it, it's been a blessing for me today because I can help children. Are you, I was going to ask you, are mm. you good at sensing when somebody is under, undergoing pain? Yes, yes. I, I, I sense it. I, I sense it all the time with children and, and even sometimes with adults. I, I, I don't know why, but I feel it. And uh, I, I can tell you stories where children were abused, and, and I, I would ask the children, you know, how's your life? And they would say, it's fine, but inside something was telling me that they were hurting. And I would you know, kind of push the issue and talk to the school teacher or the counselor, the principal, and sooner or later these children would come out and say, yes, you know, there were problems. And it's just something I think now I understand that because I went through so much pain, you can actually somehow sense pain in other people, you know, especially in children. Yeah. When you started uh, playing ukulele, um, I understand you practiced so much. Mm -hmm. You wore out the frets. I wore out the frets. I practiced. This is like when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I practiced mm -hmm. eight hours a day, sometimes 10 hours a day. Now, people think, no, how can you do that? I could do that. I would practice and practice and practice. And uh, I, my goal was to beat Otasan. I was going to become the best player in the world. But the funny thing is, the better I got, the more I realized how great the master was. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, he really is something special. And he told me one day, he says, Roy, do you want to come to the studio and uh, just help me? I'm going to teach this adult class. I says, what do I have to do? He says, oh, just tune the ukuleles. And he comes in, teaches the adults lesson number one. And then he tells me, oh, by the way, I'm going to Japan next week. You're teaching. And I was petrified. I says, I don't know how to teach. He says, no, just da 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 Leslie, I went home and I applied the same technique that I used to learn the ukulele and practice for hours and hours every day. I would talk to the walls, I would talk to the kitchen, I would talk to the carpet, I would talk to the mirror as if I'm talking to those adults. And you know, by the time I went in front of them, I was totally comfortable and I taught them. And the interesting thing is when Ota-san returned, Ota-san asked me, would you like to continue teaching those students? And I was so happy. And, and the students were happy because they were comfortable with me too. So it was a win-win situation. That's how I got into teaching. So my second mentor in life was Ota-san. And was it different teaching children when you decided to expand and, and teach children as well? I, it was unnatural for me because I, I realized that I had such a deep love for children that once I was teaching children, uh, there was a, it's a, like an automatic connection. I can't explain it. But when, uh, when I'm around children, it's so easy to bring them up. You know, I, I can just walk in a room. I can walk into my room of in instructors with students, or I can go to a school, and automatically I can feel the energy rise. And so I, I'm happy for that, that I can, you know, have this relationship with kids. But, it, I, but you know, adults, we have a lot of adults now. I, I find that um, there's a great connection with adults because they need this outlet where they have fun and just sing and play and laugh. And so, you know, it's working both ways for us now. Roy Sakuma and his wife Kathy have partnered in a number of successful enterprises. Roy Sakuma Ukulele Studios, Roy Sakuma Productions, the annual ukulele festival, summer zoo concerts, CD, DVD, and book sales, and school visits. It all began when Roy was an ukulele student himself. All this time you were taking ukulele lessons I was from Ota-san? I was taking ukulele lessons after school. And in fact, I started teaching by then. I was teaching uh, two or three times a week. I had about eight or nine students. And uh, the, the love for teaching was getting stronger and stronger in me. And that's why I wanted to put on this event called the Ukulele Festival, because people don't realize that back in the 1960s, you know, if you ask people about the ukulele, they would say, oh, that's a toy. Yeah, I mean, it didn't get much respect, no, did it? No, 90% of the people thought it was a toy. And, mm -hmm. and that hurt me because Ota-san was such a master. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing I could do, and I thought was the best thing to do, was to put on an ukulele festival where we showcase showcase the instrument. Little did I realize that now the ukulele festival today is a big event. It's an annual event and it's been going on for years and it years. It started and in years. 71 and how many, uh, how many performers did you have then? I had about 50. 
<laughs> and how it, many today? Uh, last year, we had over 900 performers. Wow. And a lot of students, a lot of people from all over the world that come and perform in the event. And you know the beautiful thing? It's free. So it doesn't cost a cent to come down to Kapilani Park and see the festival. And that, again, was a dream that eventually, uh, when my wife started helping me in 1974, the dream was to keep the festival free. And till today, it is a free event. And that is something that we are both so very, very happy. I want to ask you something about your mm -hmm. wife. Here you are doing well in the work world, but you're damaged inside. You're hurting still. I mean, you can't make that go away. Um, so the essence of marriage is intimacy. Mm -hmm. How did that work? Wow. Wow. Um, you know, the word love is so important to me. Though, though I was growing up in so much pain, that word was so special to me. And I had like two or three girlfriends over a period of my young life. I never told anyone, I love you. Because I, I felt love was such a special word. When I met my wife, she was 19 years old. She was going to University of Hawaii. And uh, I, had, I, I knew this girl was special. How? Where did you meet her? Uh, I met her through a blind date. Uh, somebody fixed us up where she came along with my wife, and then I met my, my future wife and my friend, and that was the first encounter. Well, what did they tell you about her before they set you up? They just said that she was a nice girl, and that's all and they told And you didn't say, me. oh, what does she look like? No, I didn't say that. I mean, you know, I, 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 I wasn't interest, interested in that, and, and but she, she was she was really attractive, you know. <laughs> and did you or she know anything about what was to happen when you met? No. In, in fact, we just met. And then, you know, she went back with her girlfriend to work. And uh, two weeks later, I called her up. And this is interesting because the Harlem Globetrotters were in town. And it was a Friday. Uh, and I called her up and I says, oh, would you like to go out and see the Harlem Globetrotters? They're playing Friday night. And she tells me, Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I have a date. So I says, well, how about Saturday night? And she hesitates. That didn't face you? No. She says, she says, oh, I have another date, OK? So Globetrotters play Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I says, OK, how about Sunday night? And she thinks and she tells me, OK. I mean, you know what? Because my life was filled, and I, I think I thought about this at times, was filled with so much rejection and stuff like that. When she said she's busy Friday and she's busy Saturday, it still didn't hurt me because that's not pain to me. That's just like, hey, what if she's honest? She's busy. So I asked for Sunday and she said, okay. And so that was our first date. And did you ever find out what your friend and her friend had told her about you? before the blind date? Uh, no, I never asked. I hmm, never asked. Gotta uh, ask. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I know that she was special. And the reason I know this is because I think we dated after that eight dates. And I didn't, listen, I didn't even hold her hand because I had so much respect for her. I didn't want to do anything that would damage this beautiful relationship that was coming together. And so what happened is that as we were getting closer, now I knew this was the girl I wanted to marry. This was the girl that I wanted to marry. And I felt, OK, but what, you mentioned this. What about all the issues inside of me? Mm -hmm. So I decided to tell her everything about my past, all the misconceptions, all the insecurities that are in me. I wanted her to know this. I wanted to know who she was really marrying at the risk of losing her. So over the next two or three dates, I revealed everything to her. I revealed my heart and soul to her. From the top of my head to the bottom of my foot, I revealed every insecurity, everything in my life to her. Do you know what she told me? What? When all said and done, she says, I never saw it as your weaknesses. I see it as your strengths. And it wasn't until last year when I was talking to a friend, and I mentioned this, what my wife said, did I realize that she probably saved me that day? Because had she said, you know, we're not meant for one, one another. You have too many issues. You've got to get your issues straightened out. Had she said that to me, you know, it could have 
got me spiraling the wrong way. But you were doing very well on your own. I was doing very well, but that, that was like the icing on the cake. I mean, when she accepted me for all the faults that was in me, I, um, I was able to get through it. And do you know what is interesting now? Those inner weaknesses have become my greatest strengths. She was right about that. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's helping people. It's doing things to help others. Um, you, you cannot take away what you went through, but you can now switch it around. And rather than dwell on the, the hurt that you went through, use it for the good of children and other people. And it, it's something I think everybody that goes through this, when they turn it around, it, it becomes a really inner strength to help people. My wife and I always talk about this. If we have, and you hear this all the time, if you have nothing nice to say about someone else, don't say it. Because treat the other person how you want to be treated. And, and that's, that's our philosophy on life, you know, you know, because I want people to treat me with respect. So therefore, I should treat people with respect. Basic and golden rule, that's right? right? So hard to do, but so simple and it's true. It's so simple and true. You know, you're somebody who didn't have a, a solid formal education because of the problems in your mm -hmm. life, but you've been able to become a teacher, a, a, an expert on a musical instrument, a business owner. I mean, you're even a music producer. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it just happened one thing after another. I, I, I think my wife deserves a tremendous amount of credit because she was the one in 1986 said, hey Roy, let's record Otasan, Otasan. So that was our first record and it won the Hoku for Instrumental of the Year. And she told me, hey, we should open a studio in Kaneohe, which we did. And we should open a studio in Midilani, which we did. And so she had a lot of influence on where the studio was headed, both in the recording, both in the building of the studio where we could meet, we could reach now more children. And so it, it just helped so much. In fact, we wrote a book. We wrote a book on the ukulele. And I actually started it you know, on my own thinking I can do it. And it took me five years and I couldn't finish it. And she says, where's the book? And I said, well, I'm still working on it. She said, OK, give it to me. Let me help you. <laughs> Leslie, we finished the book in four months. You see, oh. and that's that, you know, I mean, my, uh, my name is out there because it's Roy Sakuma Productions, right? But, you know, I can tell every person out there honestly that the, the success or wh whatever we do, it's the woman behind Kath. And she doesn't want to be in the forefront. She likes to stay in the background. But she is the like the heart and soul of our company. Did she have an ukulele connection before you? No, not at all. But when I was dating her, and this is how small Hawaii is, she didn't tell me to months and months later that Ota-san and her were first cousins. <laughs> I didn't know. You know, so it was meant to be. It was meant to be. And so it, it, it's just so, you know, it's interesting. You're embarking on something new, and it involves something old. Can you tell us about that? In 1970, as I was mentioning earlier, when I was hurting a lot, I, I, I was struggling. And I picked up my ukulele, and I started, the song came out of me. And it was, um, yeah, I'm not a singer, but it was something like, um, wait, now. I, I am what I am, I'll be what I'll be. Look, can't you see that it's me, all of me? And it just poured out of me. And so I didn't have to sit there and write the notes, write the words. It just poured out of me. That was 1970. And that song became a song that every single child in the 70s sang as an elementary school child. So, you know, that was I am what I am. Little did I realize this year, as I go to elementary schools and teach that song, that the song has been a powerful tool for me to help children. Because it's, it's been my whole life to help kids, to help kids through their struggles. But it's more powerful this year than ever because as I go to these schools and I ask these children, what does I am what I am, I'll be what I'll be mean to you? This is what I get from children. One child will say, it means it's okay who I am. Another will say, I'm special. But a lot of children will tell me this, it means that it's okay to be who I am, and I don't have to be who I'm not. And that is so powerful. And I, I realized that this song was meant for all to share with everybody. You know, it's okay to be who you are. You don't have to try and be who you're not. And, 
And I think that's a wonderful passage for everyone to kind of gravitate to. So I'm, I'm very happy that I'm able to share this song with all the children today. So we, we've got a concert coming up this summer where we do the wildest show in town. It's every single summer. And the, the concept is laughter, love, and hope. And at the end of each concert, we're going to have the children and everybody in the audience sing, I am what I am. So I'm really excited about that. And obviously, you've accepted yourself for who you are. <laughs> As you recall, Roy Sakuma says he was a terrible student growing up. Now, after learning so many important lessons in life, he's a teacher in more ways than one. Roy hadn't spoken publicly about the mental illness that shaped his childhood until he sat down with us for Long Story Short. I'd like to applaud him for his openness and for encouraging people affected by mental illness to seek professional help. For information on mental health resources in our community, simply dial 211 or log on to pbshawaii.org and download the transcript from this program. We'll include some information there for you. Mahalo piha to ukulele master Roy Sakuma for sharing stories with us. And thank you for joining me for another Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA.